Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com here, here once again happens to be in my home shop. And today we're finally going to tackle this rust bucket. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this joiner that came with this Mark V uh, has just a ton of surface rust on it. And uh, while I have used it just to check it out, I have not used it in real life. And we've got some mahogany boards back here. My grandson and I are needing for a project. They need to go through this jointer and I'm not gonna run them through in its current state. So in this video, we're gonna clean this thing up and uh, kind of walk you through that process. And I, I'm gonna do something really weird in our midweek follow-up, something that I like to do with cast iron. And so for sure, make a point to subscribe and watch for that video uh, episode of what we call Stumped Q&A. So let's get this going. So let's just talk about joiners in general. Uh, what they're good for is they're good for putting a straight edge on a board, either a board that has never had a straight edge or like this one that we've cut a piece off and now we would like to get a smoother edge to go against the fence or to glue against another piece of stock. So with the joiner, we can run the board across and that'll give us a, a, a nice straight edge that's also smooth. Um, also with wider joiners, there's this process called face joining, where you're laying the board down flat and running it across. That's often done to get rid of a little bit of a cup in a board before it goes through a planer. The Shopsmith joiner is only four inches wide. So really it's ideal for edge joining and for, uh, we'll talk about rabbiting at another time, but uh, basically putting a little notch or a step on the edge of the board here, running its length would be rabbiting. Um, and really for what it is, where it's mounted here on the Mark V and is used at the same speed setting as the table saw, it doesn't need to be very wide. Now, one interesting feature about the Shopsmith joiner is the fact that it's only two castings here and here, excluding the fence, of course. We have an in-feed table or bed and an out-feed table or bed. Most joiners, this is three castings, in-feed outfeed and then you have the body of the joiner and normally there's an inclined ramp here and one here so as you adjust those beds up and down they move closer to and further apart from each other the shops with joiner is unique in that that outfeed bed and the base casting that holds the the cutter head is all one piece and we're only moving the infeed table up or down to expose more or less of the blade. What's unique about that is <clears throat> when I sharpen these blades on this cutter head, they sit a little lower. Every time you sharpen the blades on a joiner, they get a little bit narrower. And you have to adjust either the outfeed table down to compensate for the amount of material that's been removed from the blades, or in the case of the Shopsmith joiner, we raise those blades up. The, uh, the blade at its highest point should be, we'll say it's level with the outfeed table. It actually stands a little, little, little teeny weeny bit higher than the outfeed table, but that's for another video. In this video, we're gonna take all these parts off so we can get to the, uh, the bed. So we'll start here with the fence. So the Shopsmith joiner fence is actually a thing of beauty. Uh, it's got a captured wrench. It's basically just a hex wrench. And when I pull that wrench out away from the joiner and turn it, that allows the fence to move left and right and to be removed. And then with that tightened, that locks it in place. If I push that wrench forward, I'm now uh, loosening or tightening a nut here that is holding that fence at whatever angle I have chosen. Okay, so set the angle, lock that down. And then bringing it forward, I can move the fence left and right at that angle. So I'm going to loosen this completely and slide this off. And I'm just going to set this on my table. And yes, I have the jointer mounted on the wrong end of the Mark V. I have it here so I can have it next to the main table uh, so I can easily just set things up and out of my way. Now we're going to take off the guard. And depending upon the vintage of your jointer, it might just lift straight out. If it lifts just straight out and it's made of aluminum, um, you, you would have had to have been careful when you slid the 
fence off because that guard would want to unwind its spring. Um, so before you do that, maybe you hold hold the uh, guard in, in one hand as you slide the fence completely off and then allow that spring tension to unwind. With this feather guard, there is a little adjustable stop here that I used to my benefit. That's holding that in place. But if I lift that up and allow it to spin past that stop, you can see that spring pressure is on. And now, yep, still got a little bit of pressure on it. And now there's no, no pressure on that at all. We'll get around to re, uh, retentioning this later, but now we're going to remove it. This little spot right here, this little uh, stop, uh, is removed with a wrench. And this one is removed from the bottom with a different socket. I want to be careful here as I'm working around that cutter head. Uh, typically, I'll just locate that <clears throat> to where the, the blade is not showing. You could put some masking tape across that just to keep yourself from brushing into it. And that little stud comes right out. Now, if you do a retrofit kit of an old version to the feather guard, you're going to drill and tap that hole. It's a really straightforward operation, and it's one we'll do in a future video because I have an old jointer that I want to add this feather guard to. Okay, so note that what's holding this stud on is a flat washer. And actually, I'm used to that flat washer having a flat ground on the side. Huh. That washer's not here. Uh, maybe it's because they've changed the joiner and ground away a little bit of the side here. That's, uh, that's not the way my, the one in my shop is made. <laughs> and, uh, and then we have a lock nut that held all that in place. So we'll put all that back just to keep those parts together. And now we are ready. And there's a chance you stumbled across this video because you've got a rusty tool that you need to get cleaned up. Um, I would say that there's thousands of videos here on YouTube dedicated to just that. But I will tell you, there are two approaches that I take depending upon the condition of the tool. If it's just surface rust like we have here, which is almost just a powder, um, I use WD-40 and Scotch-Brite. You know, Scotch-Brite is basically a, a plastic, let's call it steel wool. Um, and that's all it takes to clean it up. Um, if, if I've got really deep set, maybe even pitted areas with rust, then I use Evapo-Rust. In fact, I have a jointer at my shop, um, six inch Delta jointer that I've already purchased some evapo rust for because it's been under a cover for several years and I pulled the cover off recently and much to my surprise, I found it was pretty rusty. So um, for the WD-40 treatment, we wanna be sure that we're wearing gloves. So I'm gloving up here. Um, also, a couple other things, you wanna make sure that you have some paint thinner handy to clean up. Uh, once we get this cleaned off with the WD-40, I want to get the WD-40 off. I want to get down to bare metal. Um, and if I walk away after that, I'm going to be looking at rust again real soon. And so um, we need to be ready to, uh, to coat that. And again, we'll get into that midweek. Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention to you. We were accidentally sent... A package of these paper towels from Amazon. We had some paper towels that were just automatically being sent. And during the pandemic, I guess they ran out and were substituting. And they sent us this very, very, I guess it's expensive, but really nice, almost fabric-like paper towel. And uh, I now use these. I got some in my pocket right now. Uh, I use those as, uh, as uh, handkerchiefs. I can use them all day long and then throw them away at the end of the day. Um, and they don't transfer much lint. But uh, I'm going to use this to uh, to help me with the clean off stage. But you could use like old T-shirts, things like that to get that job done. All right. So we're going to start by 
picking a, a slightly coarse, and you can see I got uh, moderate, and then I got the ultra fine. Uh, we're gonna start with the moderate first. We're not removing any metal, really. We're just wanting to get through the rust, and so that should be coarse enough. There are a couple coarser grits of this available, but that should get the job done. And we're just gonna worry about doing one portion of this at a time. We'll get her wet and then just scrub it. Being careful over here by the cutter head that I don't accidentally spin it, potentially catching myself on it. I don't think that this joiner had ever had any wax or anything applied to it with as uh, as uniform as the rust is on here. I do see it has more rust on the very ends and here by the guard uh, that's probably from somebody's hands where they've lifted this on and off of the Mark V. And we still have a ways to go, but let's, uh, let's spray a little on here. We'll clean it off and give you a quick look at what it's accomplished already. Yeah, definitely is worth the effort. Now, there is an old sanding lesson you have to teach yourself whether you're working with wood or metal, you'll be sanding along here and you'll really be getting tired of sanding with this grit and you'll think to yourself, well, maybe I'll just go to the next finer grit. That'll take care of that one little spot that I can't get. And uh, the answer is no, it will not. That one little spot may even need you to go back to a coarser grit, never a finer grit. If you think about it in wood, the finer grit is only going to take off the scratches left behind by the coarser grit. So I got a couple spots here, here, which are really deep stains, and that happens to be a nick. So we're not going to get that out of here. <clears throat> and before jumping into the ultra fine, I want to make sure that I've got everything off that I can, and that'll just get us more of a polish. And the last thing, optional, 100% optional if you like, um, you, you can take a sander. If you have a random orbit sander, you can use some fine abrasives. I could even attach this to the bottom, but I'm just gonna put some pressure on it and uh, we'll see if that'll hold it in place. And that just, puts a little finer finish on it that I can accomplish with my hands. Okay, let's wipe that off one more time. Just to look at it. And then we're gonna cover that back with some more while we continue to work on the rest. Is it perfect? No, I still see the outlines of a couple stains here, uh, but that's all right. Considering the condition it was in when we started, I'm happy with it. Now we have all this to do. All right, it's nice and clean. At this point, I would want to get rid of all the WD-40, typically use paint thinner to do that. And then as soon as that WD-40 is gone and the paint thinner has flashed off and, and we're back down to bare metal, you're going to want to get something on that to protect the metal. I've had great success with uh, paste wax as I use on the Mark V. Um, Bow Shield is one that uh, was developed for bowing. It works really well if you like a spray finish. <clears throat> but uh, what I'm gonna show you on Wednesday is kind of weird, but something that works really well. And that is, uh, I'm gonna put some polyurethane on it. So we'll see you then. In the meantime, make a great week.